This is hard for people to understand. Anxiety is purely physiological. That's it. Anxiety is not psychological. Yeah. So I anxiety, just so just like if you're lying on the beach in the sun, the word you would use would be relaxed, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're being threatened, you're agitated, you're you're hyper alert. The word we use is anxiety. It's just a description of your body's state. Yep. So thoughts are the psyche, and I, I don't know how to separate this out because the word psychological has lots of lots of connotations to it, but it's just really think in terms of the body's re total body response to a threat. So the just like you can't fly a Boeing jet without a computer, you can't run the body without a central nervous system. It's just a unit. It's a unit response. All right, everyone. The Dr. Alex Show is brought to you by Shed Light Cold Lasers. And Shed Light Cold Lasers has been a game changer for us at HML professionally and personally at home. Personally, on a, on a personal note, I had a very bad bout of vertigo. And I got probably 85% there by going to a few different functional neurologists over the years to help me out with it. Then I bought this. And this is a game changer because one, it's portable. That means I can take it to the office, use it on patients all day, make sure it stays charged, come on home, and then throw it in my pocket and use that home. And this is what cleared up my vertigo. Now, professionally, the way it's, game, it's uh, been the game changer for us in the office is that it has cut our results down by 50%. This can get used on just about anything, any disease disorder that you can think of, it can pretty much get used on. Now, as far as how it has helped us out, it's cut everything down by 50% on our times. So when we're working with our kids with special needs, uh, when we're working with our chronic neurological disorders, autoimmune diseases, to get those people into a good point that they're happy and that we're happy, times have been cut by 50%. You will definitely want to go check out shedlightcoldlasers.com or email Griswold at shedlightinformation at gmail.com, 518-338-6658. Well, all right, everyone. Welcome to the Dr. Alex Show. And I am very excited for this guest, just like all our other guests. But this gentleman blew me away at our recent IAFNR conference, the Interdisciplinary Association of Functional Neurological Sciences and Rehabilitation, blah, blah, blah. Uh, big name, big, awesome organization. And Dr. Hanscom here, medical doctor, uh, I guess I'll use retired spine surgeon, but still practicing. Um, his presentation was amazing about how he is no longer, uh, performing surgery, but he's still helping people get out of chronic pain. And I think I'm going to let him start with his story on what got him into school, you know, why spine surgery, uh, why being a surgeon and up to what he's doing now. So doc, thanks for being on. Well, thank you. I'm excited to be here. Um, I ran across IAFNR about maybe four years ago. I gave a presentation in Las Vegas. And just the whole energy of the group is phenomenal. You know, Ryan is a fantastic leader. He's amazing. Yep. Lots of energy. Um, your whole group is very, very inspiring. So I had a great time. And I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon. I did retire from surgical practice the end of 2018. Um, and I was basically at the peak of my career. And I'm sort of unhappy that I felt like I compelled to quit because I'm not practicing medicine anymore. I'm basically teaching the world about chronic pain. And you say, well, what does an orthopedic surgeon know about chronic pain? And historically, not much. I mean, I was trained like everybody else. And I went to medical school. We we're talking about structure, bone spurs, all sorts of pathology and histology. And we learned about physiology, but somehow the physiology of the body did not come into our mainstream thinking. And so what happened, I came out of a very high-level spine fellowship in 1985-86. I had a zeal to do back fusions for back pain. Seattle had nine times the rate of spine fusions per capita as any place in the entire country at that point. Holy So cow. I was part of that. So I'm one of those surgeons who was actually on both sides of this fence. I was a zealot. I felt guilty if I could not find a reason to do surgery. I was part of that culture that surgery is the last resort. And if somebody came to me by definition, they needed surgery. 
So I still did rehab at that point in time because I did start with an internal medicine background. And so I start, I did try really hard to get people rehab before surgery, had quite a bit of success with that, but I didn't understand chronic pain. So in 1993, a paper came out out of the state of Washington that showed that the success rate of a spine fusion for back pain was, just take a guess, what do you think the success rate is for a back fusion for back pain? Well, uh, okay, let me take, let me think back to school. I'm going over, I'm going about 10 years. I'm going to think... 60%, 65%, sorry. So would you do surgery for a 65% success rate? No. Okay. Probably not, honestly. So at what percent success would you want to have before you did a big back fusion? I The number that comes to mind is 80. The success rate for a spine fusion for back pain is 22%. Unbelievable. And then on top of that, the one research paper that was published in 2001 that supported the idea of a back fusion for back pain had a success rate of about 25%, but it was slightly better than non-operative care. The problem is that the non-operative care defined in that paper was non-existent. It's basically doing surgery compared to doing nothing. Yeah. So that's the only paper that hints that spine surgery might work for back pain. So there's not one paper in the last 60 years that spine fusions for back pain is a good idea. So not one. And it represents $20 billion a year in the U.S. for back fusions for back pain. And what's really ironic is that the, the literature clearly shows, and you know this really well, is that there has been well documented that bone spurs, disc degeneration, arthritis, bulging disc, rupture disc, herniated, herniated disc, don't cause back pain. And that's been proven over and over and over again. So what the data shows is that we're doing major surgeries on normally aging spines that have been documented not to be a source of pain, yet we're, we're, yet we're upwards of $20 billion with a success rate of 22%, and the chance of actually making a person worse doing back surgeries between 40 to 60%. There was a chance of making you worse is actually double that of getting you better. I'm not saying that, that it never works. I mean, it works 20% of the time. Yeah. So if you're one of those people, God bless you. I mean, I'm, I'm excited for you. But the, there's not one research paper in 60 years that it says that it works. So what happened in 1993 is that I quit doing the surgery. But in the meantime, I took this horrendous plunge into chronic pain myself that lasted over 15 years. And so I developed... Um, rain in my ears, migraine headaches, burning sensations in my feet, skin rashes. I developed severe anxiety, depression. By I, I developed severe anxiety, and depression, and a full blown obsessive compulsive disorder. And we'll talk about this later in the show, but it turns out that mental pain and physical pain are processed in the same part of the brain. So it turns out that anxiety, depression, bipolar, and OCD are, are all inflammatory disorders. I thought it was psychological, it's actually mm -hmm. physiological. Also turns out that Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, cardiac disease, hypertension, obesity, adult set onset diabetes are all inflammatory disorders. It's all the same thing. So it turns out looking backwards that we're actually doing major spine surgery on anxiety and it doesn't work. So the data hasn't changed anything. We keep increasing the number of surgeries being done. And instead of doing one and two level fusions, and by the way, what a fusion is, is that, is that the hypothesis is that the disc is degenerated, it's moving, therefore it must be a source of pain. So by welding these two vertebrae together with screws and plates and hardware and bone, by getting rid of the movement, you get rid of the pain. Well, what you've actually done, first of all, the disc is not the source of the pain. Second of all, second of all these operations are big operations and they create a massive amount of scar tissue. So then, then they go to minimally invasive surgery, which creates less scar tissue. It's still surgery. It's still a fusion. It still doesn't work. So the hypothesis is simply wrong that disc degeneration causes pain. It's been incredibly well proven. So we're ignoring that data and can, continuing to do fusions on normally aging spines. The problem is that the downside of a failed spine surgery is brutal. People's lives get destroyed. You'll hear a lot about this from your listeners. Then what they started doing about 10 years ago, the technology became more advanced in obtaining a spine fusion. Then we started doing eight level, 10 level, 12 level, 
14 level fusion for back pain. So if a one level fusion doesn't Four, work. So 14 bones, 14 segments. Yeah. Neck to pelvis. Jeez. Holy cow. So I just ran across a girl who is trying to be, sal well, first of all, this is unsalvageable. So from my perspective, I'll just give you two stories. So I had this girl, we put a workshop on in New York at the Omega Institute. It was a five-day workshop. We had a girl there who had, had severe neck pain for about four years. And really severe pain, high dose narcotics, 10 physicians, six injections in her neck, and just kept getting worse and worse and worse. In one week, she went to pain-free at our workshop. And we'll talk about those principles in a second. So eight years later, she's the mother of two beautiful children. She's been on, she took about a year to come off the narcotics. And the last five years have been incredible. She's thriving at a level you cannot imagine. So great husband, beautiful kids, great job. She's not only having a normal life, she's thriving at a level that she never knew was possible. That's what happens. That's what's so inspiring for me about treating chronic pain is that not only do people get better, they start to thrive. So then I ran across this patient about six weeks ago being cared for in Seattle by a friend of mine. He's a rehab dog. And there's a 28 year old girl who by definition has a pretty normal spine, right? So she doesn't even have the disc degenerate. She doesn't have bone spur. She doesn't have ruptured disc. A surgeon back in New York fused her from her skull to her pelvis. Try that on for size. It's horrifying. Holy cow. Right. So as you know, when you fuse the skull to the neck, you can't tilt your chin. You can't turn your neck. You, her whole body's stuck. So she's basically, she's basically going to spend her life in a straight jacket, right? Yeah. It, it's almost like you can imagine, um, it's like those individuals that get in very, very bad car wrecks and they're basically in a full body cast. Right. So she gets, she gets to live like that the rest of her life. So you contrast her story to a girl who went pain-free in one week with essentially no interventions except understanding chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's lots of layers to it, but she started out that way. And once people flip out of these pain circuits, they continue to, they continue to thrive. We'll talk about the, neuro, neuro, the term neuroplasticity in a second. But once your brain starts to change in a positive direction, it continues to change because you've changed your filter. You've changed your life filter. So what you're doing to solve chronic pain, you're stimulating your pain, you're stimulating your brain to come off of pain circuits and go on to more enjoyable circuits. And then you're actually changing the physical structure of your brain. So once people hit that tipping point, they continue to improve over many, many years. They don't go back into their old ways. They, they keep changing their brain. And it's a very powerful process. So what happened to me, I started seeing three to five patients every week that had really bad things done to their spine surgically on normal spines. They were absolutely destroyed by the surgery. So in addition to being trapped in chronic pain, which makes people frustrated and angry, they're also appropriately angry at their surgeon. And if people really knew that a success rate was 22%, okay, why would you do that? People aren't, people aren't told that. So I don't want to go much too detail on the medical profession right now, but the medical profession has truly lost its soul. We're not talking to our patients. We're not listening. We don't know you. We don't really know the problem. And it turns out that 90% of all physical symptoms, mental, I'm sorry, all symptoms, chronic disease, mental and physical is due to sustained stress. And when I say sustained stress, it means being, being in fight or flight. So in fight or flight, you have a threat. Your body responds with a reaction to solve the threat, right? So it's adrenaline, cortisol, these little proteins called inflammatory cytokines, um, endorphins are stress chemicals. So you have cortisol, increased metabolism. So you have a stress response and the sensation generated by that response we call anxiety. So anxiety is the result of a stress. It's not the cause. And, it, and so that stress response is what we call physiological. It's how the body functions. You just visualize your car. That's the structure. When you turn the car on and it runs, that's the physiology, right? So with the body, same thing. It's your blood pressure. It's your electrolyte balance. It's your acid-base balance. It's your sweating, your muscle tone. All these things are the physiology of how the body functions. 90% of all symptoms in the body are physiological, right? I mean, that just makes Great. sense in a way, yeah. right? Yeah. 
hundred percent agreed. Right. So, so let's look at an autoimmune disorder. I mean, those are horrible. Crohn's disease, lupus, yeah, arthritis. Those are very deforming diseases. That doesn't. That's not psychological. Your immune no. system is attacking your body. Why? So what I forget about in medical school, and I'm embarrassed about this, but now becomes a major part of what we're doing, is that part of the fight or flight response is the immune system, an inflammatory response. And under certain condition, your body produces what's called warrior white blood cells, which are destructive white blood cells. White blood cells are designed to pick off viruses, bacteria, cancer cells. Anything that's foreign in the body is picked up by your, by your immune system and discarded. So what happens under certain conditions your body produces what's called warrior white blood cells that not only destroy the viruses and bacteria, but they destroy your own tissues. So it turns out that you're, it's basically threat versus safety. The essence of disease is sustained exposure to threat physiology or fight or flight. And the essence of healing is teaching your body to feel safe. So what I have evolved, and I'm starting a movement called Dynamic Healing, is that you have three parts of every living creature's way to survive. You have your circumstances or your environment. You have your actual nervous system that processes the information. Then you have the output or the physiology. So when your stresses or circumstances overwhelm your coping capacity or the nervous system, you go into fight or flight. Humans have, a, so every living creature has this. So we understand there's three parts of this problem. So again, when your stress is overwhelming, your coping skills, you go into fight or flight. So you develop symptoms. And in medicine, what we're doing is we're treating just the symptoms. And it doesn't work because the root cause is this stress versus your coping skills. So in this modern era, we don't talk to our patients. We don't get to know them. We don't talk to them. We don't hear them. We don't really understand the problem. So we don't really understand their circumstances. We don't know their coping skills as a person. And we treat these symptoms but the root cause is this, is this imbalance between your stresses and your coping skills. So with dynamic healing, there's ways of teaching you how to process stress differently. And just avoiding stress, by the way, is stressful. So there's ways of processing your stresses in a way that allow you to have less impact on your body. So you can address the input. You can increase the resiliency of your nervous system with good diet, exercise, and sleep. All those increase the resiliency of your nervous system. And then the output, the physiology, there's ways of stimulating what's called the vagus nerve or the anti-inflammatory effect of the body to go from fight or flight to safety. The essence of all chronic diseases, like I mentioned before, is sustained exposure to threat physiology. Mm -hmm. The essence of the solution is to minimize your time in threat physiology and go into safety. Yep. So it's basically safety versus threat. And I'll finish with one really critical detail. Humans have a problem compared to my cat. So the tragedy in my life is that my cat is obsessed with my wife and I'm obsessed with the cat. So there's this unrequited love here that doesn't work. <laughs> but anyway, so I know a lot about my cat. So I'm the threat. My wife's the safety, right? Yep. So basically what happens if the cat feels threatened by my stepdaughter has a dog, which obviously my cat is not very fond of, cat takes off, hisses, snarls, whatever, but then lays down and takes a nap when the dog is gone. The cat's not laying there obsessing about this dog. So as a human, we have language. We have consciousness. So if your boss yells at you or you have a bad day at work, you don't go home and just relax. Your brain is, is just spinning away. Mm -hmm. It turns out that unpleasant thoughts have the same impact on your brain as a physical threat. Mental threats and physical threats have the same impact. And you can't control your thoughts. So every human being is exposed to a certain level of sustained threat. So then you try to repress or suppress your thoughts what happens? You think about it more. Mm -hmm. So if you express the thought, if you feel the thoughts, you're in trouble. If you try to suppress them, you're in bigger trouble. And what happened to me personally in 1990, I was driving across the 520 bridge in Seattle, and I was a master at suppressing stress. In fact, that's how I became this major spine surgeon. Is I, is it, my, my attitude was bring it on. You could not give me enough stress. Yeah. So I didn't know, I didn't even know what anxiety was. As a I surgeon, you almost have to do that. Well, actually, that's what we think. Unfortunately, <laughs> that turns out to be a really bad problem because the burnout rate in medicine right now is over 70%. So oh. suppressed stress is the essence of burnout. Whole different yeah. topic, but sort of the same thing. Yeah. 
So it turns out if you just acknowledge your stress and say, okay, here it is, and then you start moving forward, you have 10 times the energy to actually do your job. So it turns out that repressed and suppressed emotions are actually more of a threat than actually expressed ones. So as a master at suppressing stress. So I was having migraine headaches, my ears were ringing, my feet were burning, but I didn't, I didn't connect these two. Then I had a panic attack. So I went from no anxiety to a panic attack. To well, 100%, panic, yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty bad deal. And see, people think, well, that's psychological. Well, not really. So what it is, is a stress chemical storm, right? You have racing heart rate, you're sweating, you feel like you're going to pass out, your blood pressure's off. And so you have, what happens is that your body just explodes. In other words, I repressed it for so long that when it exploded, again, physiological explosion of my stress chemicals, I had a panic attack. So what a panic attack is, is simply a dysregulated autonomic nervous system. So then once they started, I couldn't control it. You can't control anxiety. And so for the next 13 years, I went to psychotherapy. I did everything possible to put this cat back in the bag. I couldn't do it. So we'll talk about the solution in a second. So I did come out of chronic pain in 2003. And now not only am I fine, I'm thriving. But I did learn the sequence that you have to go through to actually come out of this hole. And it's not very hard. In fact, my successful patients all the time go, well, this is disturbingly simple. I get frustrated because it didn't have to happen. If I had just known the nature of anxiety and frustration at the time all this happened, none of this would have happened. And so not only did my patients come out of chronic pain, basically the mental pain is the worst part of it, they actually thrive at a level that they, that they never knew was possible. It's amazing. Yeah. So it turns out that only 20% of physicians are comfortable treating chronic pain. Less than 1% enjoy it. And the problem is you're trying to treat a physiological problem with structural approaches. Yep. Like, that doesn't work. Right? Which is which is partially a problem in our profession as well. Is it? Uh, well, yeah. As, as chiropractors, uh, do we, you know, we, we work on the spine, we work on muscles, joints, and we, we're doing our work. Um, when people aren't getting better, it it's maybe a limit limited thinking, but a lot of chiropractors are saying, well, we did all that we could. Now it's time to go to the surgeon. Right. They don't have the full, maybe there's other practitioners out there as well that don't have that full understanding as well that right. there's, there could be more. Well, and of course the problem is people look at surgery as the definitive solution, right? Yep. So do you think a 20% success rate is a definitive solution? God, I had no idea it was that low. That right. is horrible. So what is a definitive solution is an incredibly solvable problem. And there are literally thousands of research papers that give us the answer. But the data also shows that surgeons are categorically ignoring the data. So there's a paper out of Baltimore in 2014 that shows that only 10% of surgeons are acknowledging the known treatments that improve outcomes or avoid surgery, only 10%. So the risk factors for poor outcomes have been documented for decades. The treatments that have been successful have been documented for, for decades. So what happened out of my own experience, um, I learned many things that did not work. In fact, most of what I, most of what I learned was by mistakes. There's, I just tried everything in the world that you can imagine that didn't work. So what evolved was a book that I wrote in 2016 called Back in Control, A Surgeon's Roadmap Out of Chronic Pain. And it basically outlines a sequence that you have to go through to understand how to solve chronic pain. Then I wrote another book in 2019 called Do You Really Need Spine Surgery? That just clearly lays out the factors in deciding whether to do spine surgery or not. In other words, if you have a normal spine, surgery is not possible. Why, why is surgery going to help a normal spine? Mm -hmm. Can't do it. So it's sort of this urban tale that surgery is the ultimate answer is a disaster. So surgery is a great answer if it's a surgical lesion, but the first question you have to answer is, is this even amenable to surgery, period. Second thing is, what's the state of your nervous system? If your nervous system is hyperactive, fired up, hypervigilant, it doesn't matter what you do, we're going to make you worse. So we know when you operate the presence of untreated chronic pain, which is a very fired up nervous system, we have a very high chance of making you worse. That data is also there. Then we do know that structured pain clinics acceptance and commitment therapy, um, mindfulness-based 
therapy. I mean, there's all sorts of programs all over the country that actually solve chronic pain. But guess what the problem, including your work, guess what the problem is? It's not covered by insurance. Yep. So it turns out that spine surgery is a cash cow for hospitals. Everybody knows it doesn't work, honestly. And the administrators push us hard to do procedures. And they don't work. So they honestly do not care about the outcomes. And that's where society has actually kidnapped us as a society. I, I'm not going to throw doctors under the bus because they work really hard. But the business of medicine will not allow us to talk to the patients. So what dynamic healing is, is it takes time to understand the patient. So again, if you're treating somebody's stomach ache with pills, but they're going home to an abusive relationship, guess what? That's ongoing threat. So again, with ongoing threat, your body's chemistry is off. And so when you're full of ad adrenaline and these inflammatory cytokines, it actually shuts down the blood supply to the bowel. When you, when you get migraine headaches, guess what? Those are inflamed blood vessels in the brain. It doesn't, it doesn't just happen. So there's a physiological explanation for everything. So there's a term out now that's just a disastrous term, one of the worst terms I've ever heard of, called medically unexplained symptoms. It came about in about 2002. And what it was was doctors attempt to say, well, we don't know exactly what's wrong. You're going to have to live with this, but we'll help you live with it. In other words, we at least acknowledge you have, you have symptoms, but there's no hope. So I, I use a term called the abyss. So you're in this hole. Your life is miserable. Nobody believes you. You're not listened to by doctors. You've been dismissed by doctors, families, and friends. You're trapped, right? Yep. So there's a paper out of Texas that shows that lack of hope is actually inflammatory. So there's four factors that are anti-inflammatory that he documented social factors that directly affect the immune system. One is optimism or hope. The second one is a positive affect or positive attitude. The third one is a sense of control. And the fourth one is social connection. And in chronic pain, you've lost all of that. People get isolated. They lose hope. They have dashed hopes. They're really angry, which also fires up the nervous system. Mm -hmm. So you've lost hope. That's inflammatory. It makes the pain worse. So 90% of the body's symptoms, any part of the body, stomach, bowel, bladder, headaches, skin rashes, derma, you know, inflammatory disorders, autoimmune disorders, it's the body's physiology being in fight or flight. So the better term would be medically explained symptoms. And I'm going to sound a little cynical here. I'm going to try not to get too cynical today, but I did quit my practice to do this. We learned, didn't we learn this in high school? That if you're threatened by a bully, that your heart starts to race? I mean, yeah. we, we, we know fight or flight. I mean, this is high school science class, right? Yeah. And in medicine, I cannot tell you how much data we have about the human body. We know the human body like the back of our hands, including the physiology. And somehow we've got into this structural mode. Again, let's go back to spine surgery. We know well-documented that degenerated discs do not cause pain. The, the better term would be, instead of being degenerative disc disease, a much better term would be normally aging disc. So just because a disc is a little bit, little bit stiffer doesn't mean it's going to hurt. In fact, with less movement, there's actually less chance of pain. But yet there's over $20 billion a year being done in spine surgery for a normally aging spine. So to me, this is high school science class of just fight or flight versus safety. So I'll take a deep breath here for a second. So I covered a lot of territory. Do you want to go back and review any of this at this point? So dynamic healing acknowledges the stresses versus the person. We get to know you. We get to help you cope. We teach you coping skills. And then we help you regulate your body's physiology. So as you learn to reg regulate your body's physiology from fight or flight to safety, guess what? Symptoms disappear. I had 17 of these symptoms at the same time. 17. They're all gone. And they've stayed gone. Now, I had to practice the strategies that we're going to talk about in a second, but it's not very hard. It's very self-directed. So what we put together is that book, Back in Control. Then I developed a process called the DOC Journey, Direct Your Own Care. That's the sequence that you have to go through to actually go back to health. And you can't do it with mind over matter. We'll talk about this in a second. You can't do it with positive thinking, which is sort of a disaster. So what you learn to do is that you learn tools to regulate your body's chemistry so you spend less time in fight or flight. In other words, we give you tools to handle adversity more efficiently so you're not in fight or flight. 
So that's the sequence that we developed called the DLC journey. It's very self-directed. When you, can, when you can add on additional resources, it's great. For instance, let's take, take your practice for a second, which I know a little, about, a little bit about what you do. So what it does is that it's in your practice. The patients can go on the DLC journey on their own. Then it unloads all these other factors that affect pain onto them. And they get it. They understand it. They get control of it. Then you get to do your job more easily. Yep. So it's been a wonderful adjunct to other clinical care. It's not the final answer to chronic pain. In fact, it's not a stepwise, I'm sorry, it's, it, it's just a framework that organizes known proven medical data into an organized sequence that you can access consistently. So I'll read you, yeah, so I mean, my thing is years ago, is just implement what we already know. We have all this data that says one thing, we keep doing the old thing. So we have the data, we have incredible research, people get a paper put onto their CV, but nothing changes, yep. right? Yep. So, kind of like a, kind of like a recap. When 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 you gave your presentation, uh, it's it's few and far in between when medical doctors like yourself come out and say things like this. Um, and I think it's because of your training. Uh, medical school is, I, I mean, talk about stressful, but it is very for lack of a better term, maybe there's a better term nowadays, mechanistic. Everything is very um, broken into individualized systems. Right. Uh, but for instance, asking me to separate the endocrine system from, let's say, your bladder, that mm -hmm. ain't going to happen. I'll, I'll, I'll connect the dots 24-7. Right. But according to medicine, there's a specialist for just about anything and everything, but it's funny that you mentioned autoimmune. There is actually no autoimmunologists out there. Um, there's no specialist for autoimmune. We know who that person actually is. Family practice. Family practice, and then right like, internal the medicine, or somebody like yourself who just treats the whole person. Yep. yep. In fact, I will send you a paper written in 1927. It's a lecture with Dr. Francis Peabody out of Boston. And in 1927, he recognized that people's stresses create symptoms. He it says, it says it is unconscionable that we treat just the symptoms and don't and don't go after the root cause. Yeah. So his last statement is the essence of care is caring for the patient. So if I don't know you, how can I take care of you? We're not a machine. We're an yep. organism that responds to the environment. And if the environment's unpleasant, guess what? Your body chemistry is going to be adverse, right? Right. So there's ways of learning to regulate that in a way that's not very hard. And if medicine just, again, we learn this in medical school. We actually learn this in high school. So, yeah. Well, and, and it's funny you mentioned 1927. Isn't that right around the time Hans Selye was doing his work? And he yeah. basically got laughed out of uh, medical school? Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I don't know who that is. I mean, I know the name, but I don't remember exactly what you're referring to. Holy cow. If you want to lose yourself in what is who is probably the godfather of the stress response, okay. Hans Selye. Last okay. name is, I'll, I'll email it to you, S-E-L-Y-E. Okay. -L -Y -E. okay, got it. Beautiful. Uh, it, I, he, he, got, he literally got laughed out of uh, medical school. Uh, there was a, uh, they were in grand rounds, as the story goes, and someone was having all these symptoms. They were in the hospital bed. It must have been the 20s. Mm -hmm. And uh, the doctors, uh, the uh, residing gentlemen were all, what's going on with this person? Everyone's wrong. No one knows what's going on. Point to Hans, and they go, and he goes, they're sick. And then uh, from there, I don't remember what happened, but he basically just explained. He just goes, and it was, I think it was the 20s. He just goes, they're stressed. They have to de-stress. <laughs> really? Okay, I'm, I'm going to look this up. This is great. Well, I mean, and this, when you read this article by um, this lecture, um, you'll be blown away. I mean, it's so clear. But this, you know, this has been around for centuries. I mean, what the lecture was by Francis Peabody was he was concerned in 1927 of the interference of technology with the patient-doctor relationship. That was 1927. And of course, technology is a million times stronger now. So yeah, we turn the body into a set of parts. We try to apply different treatments to the parts. But remember, your body responds as a whole. That's how we survive. And so one metaphor I like to use is that of a Boeing jet, which has 2 million parts. 
you cannot fly a Boeing jet without a computer. There's taking an in input from the tire pressure, the altitude, wind speed, flap angles, all sorts of things are coming into that computer. Then the co computer makes adjustments to fly the plane. You cannot fly a Boeing jet without a computer. Well, every living creature is the same way. You have a central nervous system that takes in all this sensory input from the environment. Then your body, body automatically adjusts in a way that allows you to survive. And so, again, I'm going to go back to the anxiety anger thing really quickly because this unconscious response is automatic and hardwired. In other words, my cat has the same response, but my cat doesn't have consciousness. So again, she's threatened. She takes action. Her fur stands up. She snarls, she snarls and hisses. Then she lays down and takes a nap. So again, humans have language that, do, that does the same thing. We know that thoughts create the same reaction as a physical threat. So we get all fired up, but that unconscious reaction is what we call anxiety. So that reaction, our unconscious brain processes about 20 million bits of information per second, 20 million. Guess how much the conscious brain processes? Yeah, it's only 3% of that. It's 40, 4 zero. It's way less than 3%. Oh my, 40 bits. 40 bits, not, not 40 million, 40. So you have 20 million versus 40. But think about it. I look at that light, my pupils constrict. I'm shifting in my chair automatically to avoid skin breakdown. I'm not thinking about how to move my move my fingers or move my mouth that's all automatic yeah i mean watch my cat jump a 12-foot fence i mean how does she do that she doesn't think about it she just does it mm -hmm. so a friend of mine bruce lipton and i are collaborating a bit and he just made it really clear that anxiety and anger are automatic hardwired survival responses that's it so your unconscious brain has nothing to do with you as a human being so you have this massive survival response that's a gift right it's a gift we would not be alive this second without that response. So the body is designed to survive. Every action we take this second is programmed by our entire past up to this very second. What's safe? What's dangerous? What do I say? What do I, what do I not say? Which power to town do I walk down at night? Which part don't I walk down? It's all programmed, every bit of it. Who's friendly? Who's not friendly? Who's a threat? Who's not a threat? So we're programmed just like my cat is programmed. But again, language makes it much more complicated. So the bottom line is that these are automatic hardware responses. They are a gift. And what Dr. Lipton pointed out that to change these things, you might as well talk to the engine of your car. You can't change these things. They're automatic. They're hardwired. They're very powerful. Remember the sensation that we call anxiety is a survival response. It's intended to be incredibly unpleasant. Yeah. Because a species of creatures who didn't pay attention to the cues just didn't survive. Mm -hmm. So in, in addition to being survival of the fittest, is actually survival of the most anxious. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. And, and I think like one key with all of this is that the it's the understanding of the repeated stress. Right. And when I it, it happens almost daily when people come in. Uh, they're people at least this right now are going to be in chronic pain or they're, they're going to have anxieties, depressions, bipolars, autoimmunes, left, right, center. And what they'll say is, is a lot of times, oh, well, I'm not stressed. I'm happy. I'm whatever. And well, the whole point of the stress response isn't necessarily to let your brain know how your body is feeling. Right. It's meant to keep you alive. Right. So when you when you chronically go into the stress response time and time again, let's say you don't even have a psychological quote, psychological based problem like anxiety, but there is pain and there's other physical ailments. Yours has just transpired differently than someone else's. Well, I, I, let me just correct you just for a second. Cause this is hard. This is hard for people to understand. Anxiety is purely physiological. That's it. Anxiety is not psychological. Yeah. So anxiety, just so just like if you're lying on the beach in the sun, the word you would use would be relaxed, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're being threatened, you're agitated, you're you're hyper alert. The word we use is anxiety. It's just a description of your body's state. Yep. So thoughts are the psyche, and I, I don't know how to separate this out because the word psychological has lots of lots of connotations to it, but it's just really think in terms of the body's total body response to a threat. So the just like you can't fly a Boeing jet without a computer, you can't run the body without a central nervous system. It's just a unit. It's a unit response. 
So when you respond to a threat, this whole body response happens. And so that's the stress or or thing causing the stress is one thing, but it's your total body reaction that's the problem. Yes. And there's ways to learn to regulate that total body reaction. So I know we're, trying, we're covering a lot of ground today, but I just want to just hint on the solutions a bit. Um, we can't get yes. close to the whole package of it. So I will say it again, what the DLC journey is, it is a sequence that starts embracing your disbelief. Okay, you've tried everything. You know, what's this guy talking about? And it's not about believing David Haskum or believing you or believing the doc journey. It's about just going forward and learning how to change your brain. Just learn skills. If you want to become a professional golfer or a high-level piano player, you have to learn the basics and just start keeping moving forward to what you want to do. So the principle, one metaphor that I've used a lot is that the way you, the way you heal is basically stimulating neuroplasticity in your brain. And neuroplasticity is something that I did not know in medical school. We thought the brain was static, but we know your brain is like a beehive. You have 80 billion cells with each cell connected to 10,000 other neurons. So they estimate there's more connections in the brain than, than there are stars in the universe. They're just fighting for attention all the time. It's a very dynamic, huge beehive. And so it's incredibly neuroplastic. The changes happen very quickly. So as you, so, and your brain's going to really go to where you place your attention. So if you're always trying to solve your pain, solve your problems, et cetera, et cetera, where's your attention? It's on, on the, the problem. Pain. Right. Yes. So you actually reinforce it. So the way you solve chronic pain is two ways, two things. So just picture a bathtub and just visualize the water coming into the tub are, is the good things in life that you enjoy. And the drain represents anxiety and anger, which again, is just a survival reaction. And by the way, we'll talk about this later, but anger, ang anger and anxiety are the same thing. So you have this drain, we're going to call anxiety and anger. And as long as the drain's open, you can't really feel the tub, right? So the two parts of healing are you just learn to use tools to very efficiently and dispassionately and objectively just plug the drain. And you do it multiple times a day, every day. I mean, life keeps coming at us. So you just learn to process the stress in a way that doesn't take out down your energy. So with the drain plugged, when you do things in life that you enjoy, guess what? You can fill up the tub. If you're trying to use the things in life to out, outrun your anxiety and anger, you can't do it, right? So the two parts of healing are using tools to plug the drain, but the actual healing occurs as you shift into the parts of your brain that don't have pain, the play pathways, giving back, sense of conviction and passion and purpose in life, good food, good wine, good food, friends, that's where the healing occurs. But if you're doing those things to compensate for the anxiety and anger, it doesn't work. So the doc journey has seven legs. The first leg is actually embracing your disbelief. It also has you engage in simple tools like what's called expressive writing. There's over 1,200 research papers that we have these, have these obsessive thought patterns that torture all of us. The only thing that breaks these things up is expressive writing. Simply write down your thoughts, tear them up. And I'm not going, going to go into detail today why we think that works, but that's always a starting point. There's actually no alternative to it. The second thing is understanding pain, just understanding the nature of chronic pain, understanding the nature of the solutions. The third thing is what I call active meditation, where you have all these racing thoughts, the input. And just drop your shoulders for a second, drop it in your chair. Take a deep breath in, let it out. Okay, you got relaxed a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what you're doing, you're switching sensory input from racing thoughts to touch, taste, sound, smell, whatever it is. So instead of doing battle with these thoughts, you're simply switching sensory input. So I call it active meditations. It's about three to five seconds all day long. And not it takes no time. It's just it becomes part of your life. Um, the fourth thing is sleep. You have to sleep. We know that lack of sleep is very inflammatory. We know you need sleep to sort of clean out the brains, like clean out the lint on a filter. Mm -hmm. We do know there's a paper out of Israel that shows lack of sleep actually causes chronic low back pain. It's not the other way around. So without sleep, nothing else really works. Then the final thing, which is one of the hardest things for people to do, but probably one of the highest yield treatments we do, is that we discovered through our workshops, but also my own personal experience, 
that people in pain spend probably 70% of their waking hours talking about their pain, right? Holy cow. Well, think about it. I mean, I don't know if you how exposed you've been to it, but I became an I became an epiphany addict. In other words, wow. you're so desperate. I mean, the research also shows that the impact of chronic pain on your quality of life is equivalent to having terminal cancer. It's a bad deal. Yeah. You're bounced around, broken promises, you're promised all these different things. So that's why I ask people to start with their cynicism and stay there. This isn't about positive thinking or believe in David Hanscom. It's about digging into what is. You can't change your brain unless you know it's there. So generating enough belief in me or my process is not the answer. The answer is digging into what you know and what your disbelief is, and then just starting to move forward on a methodical basis using tools that stimulate your brain to change. So like going back to this anxiety, anger reaction that Dr. Lipton talked about, that you might as well be talking to the engine of your car. You can't change it. You can't reason with it, but you can reprogram it. So instead of being stress automatic survival response, it's stress a little bit of a space, then choice of response. So with repetition, you can clearly change the programming of your brain. You have to reprogram it. Mm -hmm. So the third, the final thing of the, of the first leg of five things, remember education, the expressive writing, the active meditation, sleep. But the final one is not discussing your pain. So I, if you're in my office with back pain, I say, look, I'm, here's my book. Here's the website. Here's your homework. I'll see you back in two weeks. But for the next two weeks, you cannot discuss your pain or medical care with anybody, especially your family. Zero. But I've also learned that since mental pain is actually the bigger problem than physical pain, that also means no complaining. No talking politics, religion, or COVID. No gossiping. No giving unasked for advice. No criticism. Just listen. And guess what? People don't know what to do. Because when you're in, right? All of us do this. Yeah, I just so looked when, at my producer. He's dying over there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but if you're if you're complaining, where's your attention? It's well, if so, if you're not complaining, then uh, obviously the uh, attention's not on you. Um, so then, if attention's not on you, it's kind of kind of different for some people in that regard. Well, except if you're complaining, it's still not a very pleasant set of circuits. Remember, yes. you're, so remember that there's two parts of healing. One is actually learning to de-energize anxiety and anger, which are again physiological, automatic, hardwired circuits. Yep. You create some space, but the healing occurs from moving forward into what is joyful and wonderful. So gossiping, complaining, criticism, talking about your pain, discussing medical care, those aren't positive experiences. Remember I said positive thinking is a disaster. And the reason for that is it is a way of suppressing negative thinking. That's why I want you to jump right into your cynicism. You don't have to believe one word I'm saying. In fact, I choose that I prefer that you don't. But a positive vision is really critical. Mm -hmm. Remember I said one of the ways, one of the remember the four things I talked about that create inflammation that are that are anti-inflammatory is optimism or hope, um, sense of control, community, but also a positive affect or a positive vision. Yep. So a positive vision. So people forget you're, you're so busy fighting pain, mental and physical, that you lose your vision. And it's pretty universal. I mean, think about going to a party of people in their 20s versus going to a party of people in their 60s. <laughs> right. So do, I need, do I need to say anything more? Right. Yeah. People are, people are complaining, for God's sake. Right. And when you're younger, you know, what can we do tonight? What's the next thing we can do? What's the next adventure we can do? What's possible with their lives? I mean, it's full of dreams. And in, in, in your 60s, you're financially independent. You actually can do what you always wanted to do, but you're complaining. Yeah. And the reason why is that these survival circuits just, it's like morning glory that just overgrows your whole garden. It sort of looks nice on the outside, but it's just deadly as far as suffocating your dreams. Yeah. So the key issue is you have to de-energize de these anxiety frustration circuits. Again, it's 20 million versus 40 mismatch. So as you learn to de-energize, de the real healing occurs as you move forward because you're stimulating your brain to move forward. So there are a bunch of other layers to this. The third leg is ab about anxiety, talking about the physiological nature of anxiety. Then the fourth leg, which is really critical, is about awareness. You can't really solve what you don't know. So the first step of awareness is actually becoming aware when you're unaware. 
The fifth step, which is always the most critical one, is anger. Turns out that anger and anxiety are the same thing. Remember, anxiety is a survival reaction. The antidote or solution for anxiety is to solve the problem, right? Yep. You can't solve the problem. Your body kicks in more stress chemicals and you become angry. So in chronic pain, you're trapped. You're frustrated. You're angry. Your body chemistry is way off. So where the incredible healing occurs is actually processing anger. That's leg five. The leg six is just getting practical about you develop a daily practice. In other words, you learn how to commit to yourself, get organized, and just execute. Then the final leg, I use a metaphor called of just building your house. So the end of the DOC journey is actually the beginning of the rest of your life because you're not solving your pain, but we're giving you a set of tools to navigate your life more efficiently, more enjoyably. And then who you are as a person can emerge. And people really do thrive. I mean, it's unbelievable, unbelievable what happens. Again, I had 17 physical symptoms and mental symptoms for 15 years. I, for instance, the ringing in my ears, the tinnitus was horrible. It's gone. Never would have dreamed that possible. Why? I didn't imagine 20 years of ringing in my ears. Mm -hmm. It's a very miserable symptom. I went to ENT specialists. I tried white noise, all sorts of stuff. It's gone. But what happened with my body physiology being calmer, when you're full of stress, while your inflammatory cytokines are sensitizing the nerves, and all sorts of symptoms start occurring that normally wouldn't happen. So tinnitus, very common. Many of my clients are now reporting the same thing. Their tinnitus is gone. So what happens, you'd start thriving at a level you never knew was possible. Again, using the bathtub analogy, you're not trying to fill the tub up with good things when the drain is wide open. Mm -hmm. So you learn to just dispassionately plug the drain. Then you get to fill your life with the good stuff, and that's where the healing occurs. So the final thing I'll leave you with is that if you're going to learn French, you have to practice French, right? You're not going to, pra you're not going to learn French by trying to fix your English. So remember, the default language for humans is survival. That's the default language is fight or flight. Your body is designed to keep you alive. It's not intended to have a good time. So what happens, the new language is, I call it an enjoyable life. So my question I ask people is, what do you want? What do you want your life to look like? So you have to separate from the old life to move towards a good life. And again, this happens simultaneously every day. But the solution actually is moving your brain onto these circuits that are enjoyable. So you're not going to get to that new life by trying to fix your old life. So actually to live the new life, you have to actually live the new life. You don't just have a good life by fixing your problems. You have to practice learning how to live a good life. And then your brain changes, right? Anyway, we covered a lot of turf. Um, any th maybe more than we wanted to cover. Um, any thoughts on the day here? No. Uh, this is amazing. Uh, this is this is exactly what uh, I, I would want our listeners to hear. And thank you for the reminder on the doc journey, because it that is amazing to think. I, I've already got six patients in my head, literally, of things I'm kind of tapped out on on helping them. Mm -hmm. So why not a system that, that's already there? Right. Uh, so for, for docs that are listening thedocjourney.com, something you can send your patients to. Um, no, this is this is perfect because it, it it's so eloquently put on what stress does to, uh, what chronic stress does to us. Uh, and we, we tend to think of stress in terms of psychological construct, right? Yes. But it's, again, going back to the Boeing jet analogy, it's a total body response to a threat. So yep. it's not psychological. You have a threat. Some of them can be thoughts for sure. Um, you know, poverty, racism, all these things are also threats. Okay. Again, physiological response is appropriate, but you're not imagining authoritarianism. It's happening. Mm -hmm. So you get that you get that bodily response to a threat, but again, thoughts do the same thing. Yep. So yeah. right? Yeah. And, and it's all because it doesn't matter the stressor if it's right. a if it's a thought. Or if it's a bad food, McDonald's, right. or if it's a trauma, um, a car wreck, it, it it's all processed in the same area in the brain. Correct. Yep. It just happens to be that the s stresses that we put on ourselves tend to be more psychological based. We're, we're putting ourselves in our own holes almost. Right. right. 
uh, slowly digging your own graves, if you will. Right. Uh, well, is there anything else you want to end on? Well, I just like to really um, ask people to really embrace your disbelief and just jump on and try it and do it. No downside to it. And the doctrine may be something that you resonate with or not. And if you don't resonate with it, fine, find something else. Yep. But I'm trying to tell you that chronic pain is completely solvable. The number one factor that predicts outcomes is basically engagement. That's it. So if you practice pain long enough, you'll get better. If you practice these tools long enough, you'll get better. So it's not a matter if they're going to work, it's when they're going to work. And for some people, it's a week or two. Some people, it's a year or two. But the key word is persistence, reprogramming, just sticking with it over and over and over again. And so it starts with cynicism. It stays with your cynicism. And you just start changing your brain to where you want to go. And so it's been exciting. So again, the book is Back in Control, A Surgeon's Realm About a Chronic Pain. Pain. Please don't consider spine surgery until you look at my book called Do You Really Need Spine Surgery? It just clarifies it really well. And I'm not against surgery. I'm a spine surgeon. But I'm telling you, the last five years of my practice, particularly as we were very careful about following the data, we had very, very consistent surgical outcomes. But all these surgical patients actually started canceling surgery that had surgical lesions. So I actually put myself out of business on elective surgery. So the book is very clear. It's called, Do You Really Need Spine Surgery? Please don't do spine surgery unless you've read this book. At least you know what the issues are. Then again, the DOC journey is called Direct Your Own Care Journey. is very self-directed. There's lots of resources on it. I do send out blogs and podcasts every week on top of this whole thing. Um, and then when you, if you decide to do the DOC journey, please do it slowly. In other words, people that rush to the doc journey get frustrated and they quit. So it's not a matter of just reading it and getting fixed. It's a matter of learning tools and implementing them into your day-to-day -day life. That's what makes the change. Long-term lifestyle changes. Long-term lifestyle. And just, I, I recommend maybe, maybe 15 minutes a day, just spend 15 minutes, read a, read a blog, look at a couple of videos, learn to implement some of the tools that work for you. Everybody's journey is different. But yeah, look at this as a long-term rest of your life type process. And then as you gauge in the process, you'll allow yourself to heal. You're not going to heal yourself, but you're going to allow yourself to heal. And it's a very, very exciting process. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on. Greatly appreciate it, Dr. Hanscom. Yeah. It, it, your presentation at IAFNR was eye-opening for myself and my wife, who I practice with. And um, okay, great. I assume I assume the other tens of thousands of docs. Um, and by the way, everyone who's listening, what he talked about is, well, he went into some finer details in that presentation, that's for sure. But you probably got 80% of that presentation right here. Um, and that's amazing. So. Thank you so much for coming on. I, I greatly appreciate it. This is awesome. Well, thank you. I appreciate, you know, I my practice to do this. So I love to have the platform to share these ideas. So I'm excited you're excited. And that's why I do this. So I appreciate it. Love it. Thank you. All right, everyone. The Dr. Alex Show is brought to you by Apex Energetics, apexenergetics.com. First of all, to learn more about Apex Energetics, head on over to that website. If you want to get Apex Energetics directly, uh, please call them 1-800-736-4381, or you can shop our online store. You can get to our online store at myhcpstore.com. Username is Dr. Alex. Otherwise, if you'd like to find a doctor that uses Apex Energetics, you can give them a call or go to the website and they'll direct you to a doc in your area that should be doing very good work with Apex Energetics. Apex has just been instrumental in our lives professionally and personally. About six years ago, we went through one of the most hellacious traumas that you can think of. And if it weren't for Apex with their stress support line of products, I probably would not be here. Point blank period. And in the office, you, making the switch from other lines to Apex Energetics has sped up our results with our patients, supporting them through their healthcare needs, um, probably by 25%. Um, if not, if not more. And when it comes to Apex Energetics, we just want to remind everyone that we are here to not cure diseases, making claims. We're here supporting people, increasing their healthcare needs and helping them achieve their goals. Apexenergetics.com. The Dr. Alex Show is hosted by myself, a nerd, Dr. Alex Nelson. I'm a chiropractor 
and board certified in functional neurology and childhood neurodevelopmental disorders. The show is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or most any of your other favorite podcast apps. The Dr. Alex Show is a production of Fredcasts. Think, speak, act.